Motorcycle Adventure Dirt Bike TV, supported proudly by Adventure Spec in England, Rally Raid Products, Giant Loop in the United States, Adventure Moto in Australia, Adventure Rider Magazine, Pirelli, Botool Oils and RK Motorcycle Chains. Aaron Steinman, welcome to MAD TV, around the world motorcyclist, which is as rare as uh, teeth on a chook at the moment because uh, everyone's been stopped from COVID. Mate, firstly, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this uh, around the world map and uh, boy, you've, you've done a serious around the world adventure. So how many Ks did you do in the end? In total, uh, 140,000. 140,000? Yeah. How long did it take you? So that was over about three and a half years. Wow. Yeah, with with a few breaks in between. Yeah, oh, yeah well, that's understandable. Yeah, <laughs> that's a huge commitment, um, Aaron. Um, so you've got this KDM 500. My God, either your ass is made out of diamonds or, or you found some resolution to that because I couldn't imagine sitting on that seat going across the stands in Russia <laughs> on that seat. Yeah, I know. It definitely hated me sometimes, for sure. Yeah. But um, oh, seat concepts helps. You yes. know, that was the first thing that, that got put on and got the four by two thrown off there. Yeah. And then um, I think it just comes down to conditioning sometimes. You know, if I'd had a break off the bike for a while, it, like on a winter month, so I took a couple of months off. When I get back on it, the first few days, I feel it. But then you just get into the routine and then it gets back to use, used to it, I guess. It's funny It's funny how I the first thing I think about is um, sitting on that seat. But I was looking, <laughs> at, the, I was looking at your route there and, and, and some of that, you know, I haven't gone around the world. I've only gone halfway. But some of that um, t tour that I, I've shared with you and I'm just remember sitting on the bike, you know, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and suddenly you think, oh, that's right, my bum, God, that was sore. But isn't that funny? The seat concept seat makes a difference, doesn't it? It's just a little bit broader and softer. Yeah, it is. It's definitely a little bit better and, and a little bit wider. And then um, the other thing I started to do as well is I just bought some Fox mountain bike shorts. So they've got some padding in them. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of a dirty little secret on that as well. Yeah. But yeah, through the stands, through, you know, like I, I never want to get out and do a 500k day if I can help it. No. You know, it's, it's not overly enjoyable if it's just a straight line. Yeah. But as you know, through some of those areas, when you get to like tran the Trans-Siberian, yeah. there are a couple sections that there isn't anything in between. And there's not a lot of off-road there. There's not a lot of options. So you're kind of committed to do the 500k days. And um, yeah. Apart from extremely large mosquitoes, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, you know, you definitely get to the bum shifting where you do that cheek yeah, yeah. and then you do that cheek. <laughs> <laughs> then you do both and then the leg goes up and yeah, and then you just stand for a while and yeah, so you, you sort of move around a bit. But so, I, I would look at it cyclists when I ride by and I'm like, oh, I can't complain when I see their seats. So when I look at the bike, it's a pretty, um, it looks like a pretty basic setup. So let's just yeah. go through the mods. I don't think there's much to talk about, is there? No, well, when I left, uh, it was tank, seat, bark busters, and then that was it. It was completely stock. Yeah. And then I just added stuff as I went. So as I went, um, I got a Scott's steering stabiliser, um, got different bars, bigger pegs, different wheels, changed the exhaust. Yeah. It just Did keeps you know going, you know? The, the rally pegs is an interesting one. I noticed the pegs were bigger and and uh, I'm, I'm just making up a Husky 701 at the moment. And the first thing on my list is the rally pegs because they give you greater control, but they're so comfortable standing on. Yeah. And, yeah. They are. Yeah. No, that was, a, that was quite good ad. And but, um, did, did you have to do anything to the suspension for your weight? Uh, I didn't. I, I didn't at the start, but I did... Um, end up putting a stiffer rear spring in it right yeah and so that helped and and at the start it didn't seem too bad but then it just after time turned into a bit of a lazy boy you sort of get used to it yeah, yeah. and yeah and it just needed some work the, the rear shop needed some work and the, yeah you know, it the really affects well. the steering once that the back goes down and you you know you can get yourself into trouble pretty quick yeah 
once that handling starts to drop in, you've changed the frame dynamics, haven't you? Or yeah. 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 Uh, so soft luggage, uh, were you, did you even consider hard luggage? No? No, nah, no, no. So my philosophy is dirt bikes don't come with racks. That's so um, I, I wanted to go light and that's, that was the main attitude. Like I definitely wanted to go light. Mm. And I sort of looked at racks for a start, but then when I was looking at luggage options and I came across Giant Loop yeah. and it didn't require one, I was like, well, then there's one less thing I have to buy. Yeah. And, and at the start of the trip, that's kind of what it was. I started putting the list together of wants and needs, you yeah. know, and I just felt, you know, I was trying to prioritize a little bit for the money and stuff. And I just felt the rack wasn't necessarily a, a must have. It was, yeah. you know, so I, I went with the giant loop soft luggage and I'm glad I did. Like that was the best option for that bike. So that that um, bag on the back, that's a Mojave, isn't it? Um, that's the Coyote. Coyote, I mean, Coyote. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then what a, a, a double ended dry bag on the top. Yeah. Yeah. I ended up getting, um, in the end, I got a double ended dry bag. I had, I had a different dry bag for a little while at the start, yeah. which um, I, I can't even remember the brand of it, but it failed on me right. and I lost half my gear out of it without knowing. Oh, I hate that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and it was right up when I was crossing into um, Bolivia on the route of Las Lagunas. I don't know if you know that route from the, um, uh, so it's from the Atacama Desert in the top of Chile into Bolivia and it's about 400k and it's all off road through there. So most people will do that in two days and it's a big deal to go camp out there and stuff like that. But the um, Iduana, the office where you get your paperwork for your bike is about 50k from the border. So somewhere in between the border and there, and I was standing up because I had extra fuel on the back because I had a little thing, it opened up and I got there and I looked around and the tent had sat on the exhaust and burnt through. My sleeping bag was gone. Everything was gone except, you know, a couple of bits and pieces. I couldn't find any of it. I rode back looking, I found one shoe, which yeah. I was stoked on because I had the other shoe. So I'm like, okay, I've got a pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> See, that rings for me. I've got a good mate, Philippe, and we went into the Simpson Desert. And the way you were describing it is exactly to the T what happened to him. And, and the tent fell out and landed on the exhaust. And then, yeah. just, <laughs> you know, that's the end. Oh, of it. I know. Yeah. I was just like, oh, what am I going to do now? And there was just no choice. I just had to, because, you know, you're up at 4,500 to 5,000 metres there. Yes. So yeah. it gets pretty chilly at night. And without a sleeping bag, I was just, so I ended up just having to pull a really, really long day and get into uni that, that evening. Yeah, so um, a lot of people w wonder about what to pack. I mean, you know, you've been away for three and a half years. Um, I guess the message that I can see from that is pretty simply and light. And um, yeah. yeah, so just go through that because a lot of people go, oh, what are you going to pack for such a long trip? It's not much. Three undies, three socks and three pairs of T-shirts. <laughs> or, you know, three pairs of socks and three T-shirts. It's pretty much it. And that's the maximum. And quite often I go down less. Yes. Um and then what? And, and then just two thermals. So I just have one thermal for riding in and one thermal for sleeping in. And basically that's it. Um, what gets you a little bit is just, you know, a down jacket, um, a good down jacket, and then um, wet weather gear, you know, that can add up. Four seasons. The thing is, packing for four seasons is the harder thing. So yeah. it's easy enough if you're going for two days in Australia and it's summertime, you kind of know you can judge the weather. You don't have to go you know worry too much but um dealing with a few more elements that sort of makes the weight go up a little bit yeah um, and then just a few more parts right you know i started carrying wheel bearings because they blew out on me a couple times yeah um a spare air filter oil filter which is small but you know and oil and things like that so when you start adding in some tools and some tubes and stuff like that clothing yeah. is the the thing you can leave out yeah, yeah, you, you would have been wadded around 15, 18 kilograms of weight, do you reckon? Maybe, mm, maybe, maybe a little bit more just because sometimes the tools add up, you know, and just like I said, I did carry a spare set of bearings because I got caught out on that. Yeah. So just little things like that can add up. Yeah. But, um, so you got those legs on that, uh, the giant loop system. So you, you're, you're pushing all the tools down, heavy stuff down low and yeah. forward as far as you can. Yep, that's it. Um, and then, so basically, because it's got three dry bags, one side I had all my tools, tubes, and everything like that. The other side I had my camping cooker, everything to do with that. And then the top dry bag was the clothing. 
Yeah. And then I, I just stuff anything else in between. And then the top bag was my tent, sleeping bag, sleeping pad, and anything like that. Yeah. But, so it's, um, a good, it's a good um, lesson for people. Like you sound, you know, like you're exactly the same as what I would do. And a lot of people just need to know you don't want heavy stuff up the top. You want that low and yeah. stabilized as far as you can. Um, yeah. It makes a difference to the handling of the bike, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, and then, you know, after I lost that gear in um, Bolivia, I actually didn't even replace it. So I ditched the tent and because, you know, I could find accommodation relatively cheap. Yes. So that was kind of my, my thing. If I can get accommodation for under 20 bucks, I'm going to probably get accommodation. Because yes. then I can be in a city and I can walk around, I can do what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and it's not until the countries when I got to North America that I got back into having to use a tent every mm. time. Yeah. 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 And I'm looking at your, um, your trip there. I, I just want to kind of skim over this and get some of your highlights. Um, do, you, do you have a favourite country, you, that one that really stuck out or um, some element of um, it? In terms of I know, that's probably one of the toughest questions you get, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it comes down to because each country's got something different in it. To offer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you look at somewhere like um, Switzerland and Austria, which are stunningly beautiful but there's no off-road so the riding there isn't that great you've got the passes and the, and, the and bloody expensive and, and expensive that's it you know and then um you can go to morocco which you know for me the sahara was really cool to check out and, and to ride around and stuff but i wasn't a big fan of the bigger cities like right. medication and stuff like that yes. so i so some parts of some countries i enjoyed more than others um these countries I would not go back to and these countries I would. Like, I feel like I got rushed through Colombia and I would like to go back and do more there. Yes. Um, and that was mainly because I, I was having to cross the Darien Gap, you know, the, between North, uh, sorry, Central and South America. Yes. And um, as people don't know, you, you can't actually ride through there. There's not no. like a road or anything like that. So you've got a couple of options. One is to fly and get your bike on a plane. Yep. And the other one is your um, German guy, Ludwig, who um, run the boat, a, a big sailboat, three-mast schooner. And, just, and yeah, it was a three-day sail. And you just hoist your bike up, put it on that, and go that way. But he that was the last sailing of the season for him. So yeah. I had to take it. Otherwise, I was committed to flying, which I didn't want to do. No. So I, I, put, I rushed it a little bit through there. So, so I'm going to try to tie it down again. In terms of geography, what, what, are, the, what are the ones that, that stuck out for you? What, what are your top favourites? Oh, through the, Stan, through the Stan countries has to be way up there. You yeah. know, the Pamir Highway through Tajikistan, when yeah. you're up at 4,000 metres and 4,500 metres and there's still 7,000 metre peaks all around you, you know, the roof of the world, as they call it, yeah. that's, that's stunning. Um, Hard to beat Mongolia when, you know, you're just in the big open steeps and you're sort of picking your own path, so to speak. Yes. I mean, that's, that's another one. It's like the world's biggest campground, right? You can just keep riding and then when you stop, put your tent up and that's where you are. Wow. Yeah. Any, anywhere else? Anywhere else along the way there? Um, you, you know, you know there was lots of... Stuff? So what I ended up doing is... Um, you've heard of the Trans Euro Trail? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I use that loosely as my route through um, the Balkan countries, right. through um, Spain and Portugal and stuff like that. So I, I thought all the Balkans through Bosnia, Montenegro and all that, that Transio Trail was really great through there and some good scenery. So, so just for our viewers, that's called the TET or Trans-European Trail. Yes. And my understanding is that there's uh, kind of keepers who look after certain sections to make sure that track is uh, feasible and, and works. And yes. And what you you get a download of the TET, it's free, yep. isn't it? Yeah, you can go to their website. They have a Facebook page, but they also have yep. a website. And yep. it is smart to try and get the latest one because they do change them. Yes. And uh, you, you're right. They have what they call linesmen, and right. they're from that country. Yep. Yeah. And and they go check it out. So I thought that was a useful tool. Yep. Um, I'm not one of these. Um, I didn't use it a hundred percent. You know, because some people were kind of purists and they go, oh, you have to do the whole trans trail exactly. But mm -hmm. like going through Bosnia and Herzegovina, I, I didn't, um, I wanted to go to Sarajevo, but that wasn't on the tech. So mm -hmm. I just do a detour, go there, check it out, and then pick up on it somewhere else down the line. But for um, for people in Europe or, or, or people ultimately in Australia going back out, that tech 
is a good little resource, isn't it? Or it's a great resource. I think it's like oh, fantastic. 40,000 Ks of trails already. Yeah, I think it's something like that. And the one through Portugal, again, that was a really stunning one as well. Yeah. Um, through by the River Duro. Um, and equivalents like that is also the BDR, Backcountry Discovery Route. Yes. In the States. So I was using that as well through parts of the but Just for our viewers again, the BDR is um, a, a backcountry discovery in the northwest of the state, isn't it? Northwest of the United States, isn't it? Or is it right? Oh, there's, that, it's opening up more and more. So, you know, you still have Colorado, Utah, um, Wyoming, I think, is getting on board. So more and more states are picking up on it. Yes, but yeah, de definitely the Idaho, Oregon, Washington—they they were kind of the, the yeah. That's where it, that's where it originated, and uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, other states are picking up on it, and there's a lot more there. So that's one area I'd, I'd I'd love to go, and I haven't yet. But how how was that riding? That must have been brilliant. Oh, it's fantastic. You know, it's it's awesome all the way through there, uh, and British Columbia is amazing as well, and and stuff. So, you know, and, and obviously I carried on and, and went up to Alaska and did um, the Dalton Highway up there um, that people know up to Prudhoe Bay. Just sort of to finish off the continent, you've got to get up there. Yeah, I can see that. You've gone right up. Um, so people, I mean, a lot of this journey is about um, meeting people. I, if, if anything that, uh, you know, every time I talk to around the world, uh, one, of they think, one of the things they talk about, they've got a different view on humanity. Did this, did this ride change your view on humanity um i don't know well, i don't know if it changed it as much it in heart it sort of um it did it did to a certain extent but it, it reaffirmed what i kind of believe from other travels because i've sort of done a bit of traveling over the years right is that look 99.9 percent .9 of the people out there are good they're just trying to get along and, and live their lives and, and do what they do yeah um but it's hard not to just there's so much kindness of strangers that comes to you, especially I think traveling alone as a solo traveler. Yeah. And, and it doesn't even matter with language barriers or anything like that. Um, prime example, I was in Portugal and I just went to do a river crossing. So I'd walk through this river to check it and stuff like that. About 20 minutes later, I came into, it wasn't even a town. It was just a little one shop, um, a, a, a concrete one painted white and there were 10 guys sitting out the front in plastic chairs and it must have been haircut day you know the guy had clippers and these all these guys are 60 65 something like that I pull up take my boots off it just started to rain grab the can of coke started to wring my socks out and uh, one guy comes up to me and I do what I always do and I just point to the bike and I get my phone out to google maps and I point to New Zealand yeah. and then I sort of draw a diagram of where I've come to here you know and point to Portugal and ah, um, oh, they sort of, and then I usually rub my bum, and they can, and they can see like my hard seat, and they like, they always get a bit of a laugh on that. Yeah. But the thing to that was, one guy went away, and just before I left, he came back about 10, 15 minutes later, and he had two pairs of socks for me, dry socks rolled up, you know, yeah. and he, and he was insisting that I take them, and I was trying to explain to him, oh no no, it's okay, I've got you know dry socks in the bag, I can take out, but they would not let me go with wet socks on in my boots, you know. So it's things like that, you know, and it's constant or, or you walk or you come into a campground or somewhere and someone comes up and goes, you know, I bet you can't carry a cold beer on that bike. Here, have a beer. Yeah. You know, um, which happened a lot in Aussie, actually. I was going to say, like, you had a view of Aussie. I mean, I've ridden with a lot of Kiwis in the South Island and they have a view of Aussies. Apparently your view raised about Aussies after you spent some time in Australia. Yeah. Like, well, it did. Yeah. yeah, 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 it did. It did. <laughs> Um, no, I, I look, I, I got a lot of that, you know, like I say, you know, you can't carry cold beer on the campground and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I had another lady, I was at a gas station once and she's looking at all the stickers on my bike and she was an elderly lady in her 60s or something like that. Yeah. And she started talking to me and I sort of told her what I was doing and you could see her eyes misting up. And she just said, oh, my, my late husband was into motorcycles. Yes. And so, you know, and then she walked off and I went in to pay and I met her halfway into the garage and she came out, she gave me the receipt and said, hey, look, I just paid for your gas. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah just things like that. It's, a, it's amazing, you know, and, but um, the, the, it's always like that. Up through the States, Canada, if I stop somewhere to get lunch, people, I start talking to people and then the next minute, oh, where are you staying tonight? You know, oh, you can put your tent on our um, front yard or, or whatever. So it's pretty much constant, hey? 
you know, one of the um, one of the things that I get constantly asked is, oh, you know, are Muslim cu countries dangerous, or aren't you worried about that? Well, you know, I think your your view about this would be the same as mine. I mean, people just treat you nicely wherever you go. I, I doesn't matter what culture they're from. I, I just found everyone was very very nice and considerate. You know. Yeah. And, and again, through the language barriers, right? You know, in Tajikistan, I was in there and four gentlemen were in the booth next to me as I was eating and they paid for my lunch before they left. None of them spoke English. They just looked at my bike, looked at me, could yeah. kind of see, you know, what I was on about. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think some of my most, um, you know, memorable moments about, you know, those big travel is, is just people being um, really committed to help you out. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I don't know, because I mostly travel solo, so yeah. I'm just assuming this, but I think it happens more if you do travel solo. Yes. I think people, because you, you're not sitting there, perhaps not intentionally ignoring someone, but if you're with other people, you're going to start talking in your own group. Yeah. But if you're by yourself, you're not talking to anyone else, and people either will be, you're more approachable, I think. They'll come yeah. up and talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or you'll make the effort as well, you know. Now, I know there's a few will be going on about the more practical people listening still say, well, what about tyres? What sort of tyres did Aaron have? How long did they last? Give us Not a, long enough. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, you'd be running through the tyres pretty quick. Yeah. Oh, 5,000 probably on the back, maybe 8 to 10 on the front. It was a constant. It was yeah. a constant. So um, I, I couldn't be picky for a lot of it no. because you just you just got what you had at that country at the time. So yeah. I ran through a bunch of TKC 80s. Um, I got onto the Pirelli M21s, which I actually liked. Yeah. Um, so I'd put those on where I could find it. But that's it. Like, soon as I got a back tyre, I'd be looking at the map and going, where am I going to be in about 5,000K? And where do I think I can get tyres around that area? You know, and because and my bike's too small to really carry a tyre as well. No, but no, I noticed, I noticed it's, you it's weren't carrying... too awkward, eh? Yeah, I noticed you weren't carrying tyres. And I thought, you know... That's part of the planning that goes into these, you know, looking ahead as to, to what. Yeah. yeah, that was it. And even like for the sake of when I went to Morocco, I had a good tire on there that probably had another 2,000, 3,000 K on it. It was only half worn. Yeah. But I looked at the mileage I was going to do in Morocco and I'm like, if I end up wanting to decide to do a bigger loop, what I'm going to get down there. So yeah. I had to ditch it early and, and do that. Um, the only time I carried a tire was going into Mongolia because the only I could get in, in Russia was uh, like, I think it was a Metzler AC10 cross or something. It was a real knobbly and I didn't think it would do the distance. No, 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 no. Um, one of the things, I one of my greatest regrets is uh, with the KTM 690 is I didn't have enough mechanical knowledge on the bike before I left. And yeah. I didn't know how to um, change a fuel pump. And so with your mechanical knowledge, you know, people describe me as a hammer and screwdriver guy. Where are you on this, on the scale of mechanics? I'm about you. I'm with you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm no mechanic, that's for sure. So, right. so um, oh, look, I can do the tyres and if the wheel grooms went, you know, that's yeah. okay and, and stuff like that. And, yeah, I, I did carry end up carrying a fuel pump, so it's easy on my bike. But yeah. that was the other beauty about that bike. It's just a basic dirt bike, you know. Yeah. So everything's pretty straightforward on it to do pads and things like that. The fuel pump in the tank on the 500? Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. And you just yeah. pull it out and you've got a clip, yeah. And yeah. Stick it back in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that's so it's, it's, it's nothing. Look, if something major went in the motor, then the, the chance, to, you're not going to have the parts to fix it anyway. So you probably, by the time you're somewhere to get the parts, you're probably going to be able to run into someone with a bit more mechanical knowledge than myself. Yeah. But... I think I did a lot more preventive maintenance than other yeah, people. I was going to say that. I, I look at your trip and um, the thing that strikes me is your preventative maintenance. Like you were thinking ahead, far, yeah. um, really thoughtfully about, okay, well, this is where I'm heading next. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so have a chat about that for us because it's um, that preventative maintenance, you, you were much stricter on that than I would have been. And I think it held you in good stead. Yeah, oh, oil changes and, and air filters and the basics like that, you know, are pretty regular. Um, I think probably the biggest one I did, um, the safest call I did, which was also a hard one, was when I was in the country of Georgia. Yes. Because um, 
you know, originally I, ha I had planned to go from London straight across to Magadan in, in a summer. And as things worked out, I ended up in Ireland and then Scotland. And by the time I came out of Morocco, <laughs> I was like, I'm never going to make it before winter. So no. it was either going to have to do really long days or throw the plan out the window and take it day by day, yeah. which is what I did. Yes. So hence I ended up in Georgia with 50,000 more K on the bike than I anticipated. Yeah. And and the motor had done a hundred odd thousand K at that stage, a hundred thousand. Yeah. So I was just concerned about the bottom end on yeah. it. Like the top end, it was running fine if you everything, but I don't know if anyone had done that mileage on that bike with that motor before. I don't think too many people have done the miles you've done on your AXC. Yeah. So and the thing was, I mean, they're a knocky motor anyway, but Again, I, I was looking at the next leg thinking, okay, now I've got the stands, my goal and all that. Like, I just want peace of mind, which is massive when you're traveling alone. Yes. So um, because it's coming on winter, I decided to go back to the States for four months and work. Yeah. So I pulled the motor out of the bike. It was just too big to fit in a wheelie bag. So I started pulling it apart, you know, took the clutch out, obviously, and took the starter motor off and just made it light enough and put all the bits and pieces in one bag. And then mowed in the other wheelie bag and then went to the airport, checked in. I felt like a little drug smuggler. And then, um, yeah, took it back to the States with me and I got it rebuilt there and then um, put it in a chili bin or yeah. esky for you and yeah. um, and shipped it back to Georgia. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, was that was, a, that was a, a, a great thing to do. I, I think your call was right. I mean, um, you know, the EXC 500 is a great engine, but I, I don't think anyone's taken it to that length. You know, yeah. It's a great um, tribute to the engine, actually, to last that long, you know, considering... Yeah, that. it is. Yeah, no, they're a solid donkey. Yeah, so um, any illness along the way? Um, no. I, I, I had a couple of days that I got, I got, you know, physically sick, you know, and, I, and it might have been something I ate or, or what have you. In um, Turkey, I was in, like, San Liferi or something, far eastern Turkey, um, and I just started vomiting and it came out both ends and I was, I was done for two days, yes. you know, and, and just held up and, but then came right. And, and that would have been the worst of it. And that happened to me, I think three times, once in Chile and then once in Tajikistan. And I heard Tajikistan is, is quite known for that. And yes. I was trying to be super careful, but I only got, I only got a little bit, like I only got a, a day of vomiting and I was still able to ride that day. And then the next day I shook it. So yeah. What's your what's your food policy? Do you eat what, what everyone else is eating or yeah. Yeah, like a, a lot of times when I'm in countries like all through South and Central America, I'd see where I'd eat where the locals would eat. And quite often to the point, if you if you're staying somewhere in a town or a city and you can see there's other tourists around and they're eating somewhere, I normally keep walking a few more blocks until I don't see tourists, because yeah. then it's going to be a whole lot cheaper and it's the same food. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> So that was kind of my thing, just sort of get off the beaten path. Or like Morocco, if I'm driving along, riding along, and I see a minivan full of tourists that are pulled over, I'm like, well, I'm not going there because that's going to be more expensive than anywhere else. Yeah. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, through Alaska and Canada, I was just eating because I was super, I was going super cheap through there. And so it was bags of those $2 bags of pasta and rice nearly every day. No right. rice. Yeah, it was, <laughs> the diet was pretty minimal. Now, what's your top top countries for food? What's what's up there? What ones did you like for street food? Um, I I quite liked Central and South America for the fact of like, like I I can get along with chicken and rice all the time. I'm sure, it was chicken, so, and not guinea pig. No, 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 no. I'd stay away from the guinea pig. But it seemed like everywhere you went, you'd just see rotisserie chickens on the side of the road going somewhere. Oh. So. Okay. That was my routine. I just stop and get chicken and normally rice, and there was fresh fruit there as well. So yeah. that was the other nice thing to be able to go. Oh, I'm going to have an orange juice, and that's actually proper orange juice or fruit juice. You know, it's, it's yeah. whereas as you probably know, once you start getting from the stands further on, all it is is that chaslik or whatever the yeah. kebabs, which you don't know what meat is, and Morocco, uh, Mongolia is terrible. Yeah. yeah, good luck trying to find fruit or, you know, some decent food. It's, it's hit and miss, eh? So, yeah, by the time I left Russia, which was, you know, that plov with, you know, grated carrots and rice and a couple token gestures of meat on the top. Yeah, not much. Yeah, I, I went to Thailand and I'm waiting for my bike to ship and I was just loving the food there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember coming into Thailand and went, oh, I'm blessed. Yeah, yeah. Let's get back to some practicals for a minute. The... um. 
you, 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 you know, fatigue is something that uh, really is a challenge for all riders and the gear that you ride with is absolutely crucial. So what, what's your gear strategy for what, what you're actually wearing during the day? Because temperatures can vary. What, what's your approach to that? What, what were your layers? What jacket, that sort of stuff? What were you wearing? Um, well, I had the uh, Alpine Star Tech 7s right. boots yep. most of the time. I went through a couple of sets on those. Um, I like those. For me, they were just super comfortable, really comfortable. The only downside is they weren't waterproof. Yeah, um, my favourite. I, I love them. Yeah, they, they can't, and, and they're more comfortable to walk around having that kind of hinge. Yep. Um, and then the climb gear. So I had the Traverse jacket and then the, um, I can't remember what, what pants I had. I went through a couple different sets of pants, actually. I can't remember what the last ones were. Yeah, but, but basically Gore-Tex with big zippers on Gore, it. Gore-Tex was that. It was normally the light shell and Gore-Tex. And then I'd have a rain shell over the top of that, which I didn't really use that often. Yeah. Um, and then... From London through Europe and that adventure spec, they helped me out. Yes. Yeah. So so they gave me um, their pants and jacket. Right. So okay. yeah, so that helped through there. But um, really, really good quality and, yep. and lasted and everything like that. Yeah. Just not quite my choice. I would yep. do again for a long extended ride. Yeah. Like I still use the jacket on a daily basis if it's a great day out. Yeah. And, and it's held up amazingly. Yeah. But what I found is when you're going through like those stands like Kyrgyzstan and stuff like that, this, it's this, the change in altitude you can yeah. go up. Like, oh, so yeah. you, it can be cool, you know, it can be nice and warm. And an hour later, you're 2,000 metres higher and it's getting pretty chilly. Yes. So you need something that with ventilation that you can zip up and, and without stopping, like I hate stopping to have to put on or off a layer, you know. That's, that's just, to me, it's annoying. And yeah. Yeah, so, I had, but that climb gear that's held up awesome. Yeah, too. I had a um a Klim uh, Badlands Pro. I still do for for the international stuff. And people go, oh god, that looks like a heavy jacket. But I didn't. Mm. What was your view on body armor? Like that comes with body armor in it. You know that D thirty. What's your? Yeah, actually, I think it was a Badlands paint that I had. Um, that that was enough for me because I think it comes down to the the attitude too, right? Look, you're not doing a motocross race. And you're not, and, and I'm by myself, so I'm not going out there and just going hammer and tongs, pinning it through through these trails. I'm no. sort of like you're pulling it back, you know, yeah. you're riding a bit more sensibly, and I'm yeah. thinking about the bike a little bit too. Yeah. So like, I didn't feel like I needed all the armor and everything like that. No. So it's a different style of riding, isn't it? Yeah, and um, yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, talking to a number of international riders, there seems to be this convergence of ideas, but whether it be gear packing. Or, or the gear you use, um, it's, it's really interesting that there's a kind of a, a centralised body of knowledge that we've all learnt through either sharing information or our experiences in terms of what works and what doesn't. Um, so with your underlayers, what, what did you have for underlayers on your jacket and that? Um, well, if it's cold, I had a down, like I, I have a Patagonia down jacket, the um, yeah. midweight one. And like down, you just can't go wrong with, right? I mean, it's so packable and it's so light. Yeah. Use it as a pillow, do whatever. And and with that, if you've got a windstopper, then that's really all I need with some thermals. Yes. And um, and I went with Merino. Merino thermals were amazing. Yeah. You know, you can't go wrong with Merino. And I don't think that you can, um, you know, they're not cheap, good thermals. But they're worth every penny, eh? Because that's that's where it starts off with the layering, really. Yeah, when I um, you know, when you get down to around minus four, you know, a couple of layers of thermals and a windstopper, and you've just about got it checked, provided you've got yeah. your gloves right. And you yeah. you might be starting to get a bit cold in the feet though with tech sevens, but yeah. Yeah, well, again, good socks, you know, um, that helps. Different yeah. different socks. And then I just had a like I hate thick gloves. I'd never wear thick gloves. So my gloves were um, the Klim ones, like the Dakar ones, which are yeah. super thin. Yeah. And um, so I would have another thin Merino glove under them at the most. But the big, biggest thing that helped me is um, the giant loop um, handguards, the Bushwhackers. Oh, yes. Yeah, I use them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, they're not the prettiest things in the world, but they're the most practical things in the world. And you can cut them to fit their size. But, and they fit perfectly down the side of that coyote bag. Yes. So, yeah, they pack really away. So 
to yeah. me, they were a lifesaver in the rain and the cold. Like then I didn't need to have really thick gloves. I still I still use mine all the time, particularly in cold and, and wet. Like they're, they're yeah. amazing. Yeah, no, I yeah. think they're a great thing. Yeah, people look and they go, oh, what's this? He looks like elephant ears. Well, they work. Yeah, I know. I work. I know, like, I don't care. If it's practical, my hands are warm. I'm like, Who, who's looking at me? I'm in the middle of Blimmin, Argentina, in the middle of nowhere. You put them in your bag, they pack flat, you just stick them in your bag, and you, they've taken yeah. no volume at all. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, for me, they fit perfectly down the sides of the Cody bag on the outside, one on each side, because they just mold around there. Yeah. 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 Helmet. What's, have, do you go through many helmets? Or, or, or yeah, you... I went through a couple. Um, I had the Bell MX9, that, yes. that Bell 9. And then that um, Klim Krios was the last one I had. Right. Yeah. How did you find the Krios? Good. Yeah. 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 It's held up. It's like the packing, the inside's starting to go out. But look, I'm not easy on gear whatsoever. Yeah. And um, it's, it's tough because it's hard to look after a helmet when you're on an extended trip like that. No. You know, it's not like you can jump in the car at the end of a moto and put it in its nice little cover and take no. it home, put it on the shelf. Mm. So I just resided in the fact that it's probably going to be stuffed by the time it's done. It, it hit the ground so many times, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, it held up fine. Yeah. Um, what I found with the, the Klim Krios Pro is um, it's very stable. Like, yeah, it's very light and stable. Yep. The, yeah. That's the thing that that struck me like i mean you don't have a fairing on your bike but even with fairings it's pretty pretty stable no uh, uh, i tried yeah i tried the fairing eh? but Did it you? just didn't work yeah yeah i got i got really? one put on the proper um rally raid kit got put on oh right that the big, bigger one yep yep, oh, well, yep i didn't yep. know that yeah 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 no it, it all got put on and all but it just you know for whatever reason, like I love the build quality and everything like that. And it was the original KTM fairing and everything like that. But it just, it did my head in for the buffeting. Like I'd get to 70, really? 80K and it would just rattle. I'd, I'd have this rattle. Oh, no. And um, we spent a day and a half on it, trying oh. different suspension setups, different helmets, different whatever. And for whatever reason, just, you know, if I sat down a little bit, it'd be fine. If I went up a little bit, it'd be fine. But my riding position, it just didn't work for me. So I was like... Oh. Just pull it off and just yeah, wow. Suck it up, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> it's only wind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I've just got this um, 701. I've done a bit of riding on the 701s with no fairing, and you know, in Australia on those big open, you know, 100, 110 k's, it, it knocks the crap out of you after a while. You know, this, but um, you, you must be tougher than me. These kiwis. I don't know. I don't think I am anymore, but I do think you get riding for it for sure. Like you do get riding for it, right? When you're doing it day in, day out for a few months in a row. You're hanging just, on. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's just those muscles you're used to the whole time. Right. Yeah. So, mate, you've, you've picked the KDM 500 EXC. That's an unusual pick for this ride. But before we talk about that, what's your riding heritage? Where, where did you grow up? When did you first get on a bike? What were your favourite bikes as you were growing up? um oh i think i was probably about eight or nine when i first got on a bike just my brother older brother had bikes and his friends had bikes so they were sort of around um and then when i could sort of get a bit older and get my own bike i was uh into the old honda xr so i had xr oh, yeah. 200s and xr 250s yes and then moved on to the kdx 200 yeah um, and i was just doing what we call hair scrambles in yes. uh, new zealand um just two hour events and some four hour events and then, um, we share so a, yeah, I, I had some KDX 250, RMXs, different styles. And then I kind of went away from bikes for a while. I got into snowboarding. I moved to the States. So I was, snowboarding was my passion for many, many years. Yeah. And then um, when I got back into bikes, I got into a street bike, CBR 600, and found out that tar seal hurts. And oh. um, yeah, so um, got rid of that and then uh, got into a little bit of moto so i bought a little crf 250 rr yes and yes. so um yeah washougal was pretty close to where i was living so that was a good track to be at so i was just doing tracks for a few years around there yeah so yeah it was really fun but your your history is very similar to mine i mean yeah, i was into the honda pro link xr 250 i had a kdx 200 i, th I think yeah we mirror just about basically yeah. that, that must have been a rite of passage so yeah, before adventure riding was around right yeah, it was before adventure riding was called adventure riding. <laughs> yeah. 
which which wasn't that long ago actually. No. Um, so I'm I'm thinking of all the bikes you'd take on a round the world trip, and you pick a KTM 500. How did how did that happen? Um, well, originally I never thought I never set off to go around the world, so that was a big thing to deciding to what what to buy. So really, what, what I started out to do was my goal was to ride from New Zealand to Portland, Oregon, and that's where I had lived for many years. So right. th that's really that that you know the the stint of the trip was going to be 20, 30,000 k and just through South and Central America and up. So when I decided to pick the bike, having that in mind, I thought, well, you know, I'm not doing around the world. Once I get to Portland, if I buy something like a 690 or something that's road legal in New Zealand, will that be road legal in the States? And will I be able to get that street legal over there? Or will I end up with a bike that I, I, I don't have a use for? Yes. So I thought, well, the one beauty about the KTM is even if I can't get it road legal there, I've still got a good dirt bike to go out in the woods on and, and play around with. So you're always going to have a useful bike. Yeah. Um, and I'd just come back from going doing a trip to Laos and Thailand and I'd rented some bikes over there and I knew I wanted to go light. So I, I, I knew I wanted a light option, um, something that I could keep if it wasn't going to be road legal. Yeah. And growing up with the XRs and stuff like that, to me, I looked at the 500, I was like, that's like a modern day XR 600, right? Yes. I it mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's a wheel stand weapon. Yeah. Um, and so it's a fun bike. So I just it ticked all the boxes for me. You know, yeah. I know it's not for everyone and I may not do the same choice if I was doing it around the world. Yeah. But for what I set out to do, it was going to check the boxes. Yeah. And then and then what it just grew on you. And as your trip, your trip just seemed to yeah, grow. Yeah, well, it just grew. The, the trip just grew. You know, I got, I got to Portland and I went, right, I'm done. And then after about a month, I'm looking at Google Maps again. I'm like, well, this just seems a silly spot to finish. At least if I go to the top of Alaska, I've done, you know, bottom of New Zealand to the top of the continent. I've you know, I feel like I might have accomplished something. Yeah. So I, I set off and, and that was another summer. And then I came back and then I was like, right, I'm done. And then Google Maps come out again. And uh, well, at that stage, I after a couple of months, I had just decided I would move back to New Zealand. Yes. And then I looked at the bike in the garage. I'm like, well, what am I going to do with the bike? I was like, well, I might as well ride it back. But instead of going the same way, I'll go around and down. So, yeah, look at the map. Portland, Oregon to Magadan, Russia is a complete... 360 so i'm like do that <laughs> it cracks me up because i look at your your route there and even in england you don't even go direct you get you pop down into ireland and then you pop oh, down into Morocco. i know i hadn't planned on that either but that's how, how it keeps rolling like i get to london and then i look at the map i'm like look if i don't go to ireland now i'll never do it right i'm right here so the next minute you're at the bottom of ireland and then i'm like well i might as well do Scotland so and if I do that I might as well go to the top so yeah. it, it just kept evolving like that yeah, yeah. I can see those little branches they're quite significant branches some of them would be a couple of thousand kilometers and you've gone out you know pop back up and um I'm so pleased oh, I know. through Europe I was like a drunk bee all of a sudden I found out about another pass or something I'm like oh I'll just do another circle and another loop around here and yeah yeah, yeah you can see that in your in your thing <laughs> it really it really had a, a, a cracking go at it yeah it's it's inspiring actually yeah it's bloody brilliant yeah so I was kind of watching your, your trip through Facebook because I, I know there was a whole lot of people you know just watching and being inspired by what you did and you, um, and I think this is the first time I actually talked to you. You rocked into Australia. It's going really well. You're nearly home. And then you get to the Ayers, Ayers Rock and you're at the campsite and, and your bike gets, gets stolen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that struck a chord with so many bike riders and, and mm -hmm. the community in the area. And it was a rotten thing that happened. But... I remember reaching out to you at that time and I rang you up and had a bit of a yarn to you and gave you some hints, but um, yeah, just, just run through that um, a little bit. Like, you know, like the devastation, you've been with this bike for years, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you know, like I've never been attached to vehicles in the past or bikes, they come and go, they get sold. It's not a big deal, but that was just one bike. I'll never sell. It's going to end up, above the fireplace in the garage or whatever on a wall something yeah so and it, it was it was devastating you know it, it, obviously someone thought they needed a little bit of fun that day and they decided to take it um but yeah no I was just I I was just truly devastated because I felt like a bit of a failure because no matter if I didn't get it back I just felt like 
I hadn't finished what I set off to do or what I started to set off to do and it was all for nothing, which doesn't make sense because no. you still had all the experience and all that. And, but that's how I felt, like I, I truly did. And, you know, people were reaching out to me going, hey, look, I've got a bike you can use or what have you. That wasn't the point. Which is amazing, but it's not the same, right? I'm still no. like, I, it's, it's not the same. But, um, I, you know, that's another situation where the kindness of strangers just jumped out, you know, the amount of people that were helping and uh, the guy in the campground couldn't have been nicer. He, he came over to me and I'm sitting on my tent you know, at 10 in the morning, it's going to be a 40 degree day. There's no shade. It's in the dirt. It's like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm just trying to book a ticket. My phone's, phone's going flat out of here. And, you know, he said, oh, look, just let's put you up in a hotel for a couple of days. Let's get you sorted out, which is amazing. Yeah. And then, um, so I sat, I sat in there and I just couldn't sit still. Like I, at lunchtime, I'm like, I've got to do something. So I went out because it is a small community where we yeah. were in Yulara. Um, and so I went into the main square and there's a lot of groups of Aboriginal people sitting around with um, doing paintings and stuff like that for tourists. And so I just went up to each group over an hour or two period with my phone and just said, hey, do you mind if I show you a photo of something? And they would go, oh, OK. And I'd sit down with them and show them a picture of my bike mm -hmm. and then just explain to them, hey, you know, me and my bike, we've been on this big walkabout for a few years. Um, I got up this morning and it's gone. And I'd just like to know if you know anything about it, where it could be or, or any information. And a lot of the times they would say, you know, well, have you been to the police? And I'd say, well, look, I've been to many countries and in some countries the police are good and yeah. in some countries the police are bad. And I go, I'm not from here. I don't know if the police are good here or bad here. But here's my phone number. Um, if you have any information, we don't have to call the police. Just call me and we'll just yeah. go from there. You yeah. know, and then after a while, I started getting feedback. Like I'd walk to another group and someone would come up to me and go, oh, you were just talking to the uncle of someone we know who took it yeah. and we saw it in our community. So it was working and people were starting to come back and say, well, we think you'll get it back. We'll talk to the elders and things like that. Yeah, you so, may recall yeah. I, I, I rang you and I said, the elders will know the key to this. And they'll, yeah. now that, you know, if you spend time with the elders, that they could very well sort this for you. I and, and I truly believe that's what it was, the, the yes. Bush te te Telegraph work. And yeah. it went viral on Facebook. It went viral on Instagram and all of that. I mean, that's one blessing for social media, for all the other things I'm not such a big fan of for some things. But, you know, for that, it, it really helped. And it even got to the point where um, they found one of my bags in the desert. So we had a direction. Yes. And I, I, I called up a, a helicopter place just randomly because everyone was saying, well, it'll run out of gas. Wherever it runs out of gas is where we'll end up. Yes. I'm like, well, that's great because I just filled it up. So I've got 300k range in the tank at least. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> big circle. But anyway, I called up this place who rented out helicopters and, and um, I said, how much for an hour? And it was ridiculous price for me anyway. I'm like, oh, I, there's no way I can afford that. And he said, oh, well, what do you... We, what were you calling up about? And I said, oh, my bike got stolen. He goes, don't worry about it. We all know about it. The pilots know about it. We're already flying lower than normal. We're keeping an eye out. You know, that's the extent it got in, in the community. Like, it, it was truly phenomenal. And uh, and so even it was a Sunday, and that evening the park ranger, with well, the sheriffs, they weren't even supposed to be working, and yeah. they got a hint that it might be in a, another community, yes. and they went out and they found it. And, wow. and they got it. So, yeah, like even off duty when they weren't supposed to be. Yeah. No, that's but fun. it was trashed. It was absolutely trashed. Yeah. yeah. And, but and I don't care. Yeah, but you got it back. I mean, that's the. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 And, you know, and, and then from there, the, and then just the kindness keeps pouring out, right? You know, now I've got to work out how to get it back to me. And, and the only tow place around wants 2,400 Aussie for a 400K round trip. So another guy jumps up and messages me and says, hey, I can go get it for you. Wow. Um, yeah, and then take it to Alice Springs and then Michael Vroom up in Alice. Um, they got it taken care of for me up there. The stage KTM kicked in. They helped me out with some parts to get the, you know, because, again, it's 40-degree day. I don't know if the guy's fully pinned it in the desert, if he's cooked it, what he's done with it. No. Um, you know, everything that can be taken off has been stripped off it. It's been painted black. Yes. So, and you, and you got it back and got it back and if the, you know i couldn't keep up with the amount of people that were messaging me throughout all of australia to go when you get to brisbane when you get to melbourne when you get to wherever i've got a room for you i've got a garage for you and whatever you know 
the positives outweighed when I looking back on it now I mean it was a devastating day and I don't want to relive that morning but not knowing when you know the outcome but now knowing the outcome I, I look at it and it's a bit, it's a big positive really you yeah know? and it's that so. humanity getting behind a, a passion and just lifting you and carrying you and uh, yeah yeah and that's the thing you just can't let that one person you know affect no. everyone else's kindness that goes around you've just got to ditch it and even to the point where you know, people have asked what happened to the guy and all of that. And I'm like, you know what? I don't even care. Like, no. I, it's, it's, it's not even worth me worrying about. Like, all I care about is looking forward. And I've got the bike. And let's just go forward with this. So, yeah. So, so Aaron Steinman, round the world motorcycle adventurer to the extreme. What do you got planned next? You've come home. How was that? a break? <laughs> so well, well, for me, I got back just as COVID hit New Zealand and lockdown was yes. coming into effect. So, um, yeah, and luckily my cousin has a little farm down on the west coast of South Island, so it, it was an amazing place to be. I could still go out and fish and, and do what, you know, life yeah. goes on as normal, so to speak. But, um, we're, well, we're all pretty restricted. I mean, there's ideas mm -hmm. out there. But at this stage, I just need to, need to get back into routine for a little while, yeah. save up the money again. Did you find, um, I found it difficult to adjust when I got back. Like, see, you know, even, even sleeping in the same bed and um, I don't know, just get, like I literally uh, finished the trip and I was back at work within two days. And yeah. my head was not in no. the yeah. Nah, so I, I didn't have the, that work to come back to to get immersed in straight away. So I've yeah. sort of been drip feeding myself. But as you know, trying to set set up this interview, how long that took, because I was just down south for six weeks. Yeah. So, you know, I've still got that lifestyle where I'm like, well, it's sunny for the next three days, so I won't have to really go back north. <laughs> yeah, Fina, so, I've, I've got to say, you've been the most pain in the ass interviewee to get on, <laughs> on the mad TV because you... You live such a, a, a lifestyle at the moment, like you're absolutely free and, you know, you can just change, change and tack at the blink of an eye. Yeah, yeah. So when, if I get, like, more into a set routine, it might be a bit different, but I kind of like that, though, you know? Yeah, mate, it's it's completely random. So you don't have anything in, in mind? You don't, don't have anything? Um, look, I don't think I'd want to necessarily go back to places I've been. So no. Africa would be the glaring obvious one when you look at the map. Yes. You know, to do something in Africa. Yeah. Um, but I do like the idea of Himalaya. Yes. Um, and Pakistan is sort of yeah. been coming into my mind of late, um, up, up around that sort of area. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, know, I, I just look at places I haven't been, I guess, is, is the big thing. Well, uh, what I'd suggest to you, having done a bit in the Himalayas, highly recommend the Himalayas. Get up there. Food's good. People are great. Stuff. Yeah, scenery stunning, and I'm going to take up your. As soon as we get out of this COVID thing, I want to head uh, either northwest uh, and and get on that um, those trails in the northwest of um, America, or yeah. I want to head to the Tet, and I want to do some of this Tet in Europe. Um, that they were the things that would do me just fine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, both good options, both good options. But you know, you've always got Harold there at um, Giant Loop to go. Sort you out once you get over into yeah. Oregon and you know, show you some trails like. around there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the, B, the BDR, like America's pretty neat for that. I mean, it, it is pretty stunning. Colorado's amazing. I, I've loved that state through snowboarding. I've snowboarded a lot there. And um, it's good to see it in the summertime as well. Yeah. Um, you know. So um, there's two things we've got to do. One, all this interview, this dog, come on, has been wanting to be patted all the time. This is Lily. So Lily, hey, I'm down here with one arm just patting the dog. And, <laughs> um, but the other thing I think both of us share is uh, very strong support from um, Harold at uh, Giant Loop. He's been a great yeah. support for both of us. Yeah, he has. He has. And, and you know, like when that my bike got stolen, those bags went missing. He was, you know, I had offers from other companies, actually, you know, which was great to, yeah. to supply me with bags again. But Harold was one of the first and, you know, no questions asked, look, how, how fast can we get you a bag? Let's get it taken yeah. care of. No, he's been a great, great supporter of, um, you know, big adventure rides and, and people out there doing it. And so we'll give, give Harold a big shout out. But Aaron, it's been great. And they work, right? 
Like bloody and, work. And, and that's the most important part. Like I wouldn't do it if they didn't work. So yeah, just yeah. just on that, I mean, people go sometimes they say, ah, oh, you're sponsored, therefore you'll say that the gear's good. And well, no, I don't function like that, and I don't think you would either. What no. I found was I was looking at the gear and saying that will work, and then yeah. I got the gear. Like it's not, yeah, yeah I, I I don't um yeah, it's it's been bulletproof. I've had a number of different bits of the gear. Um, one different system that I use a lot of is the Cisco U panniers. They're like um, two like bag panniers that droop over the sides on. Rack. Okay. And they keep your gear really low and centralized and allows you to put that top bag because I've got the filming gear in between my, um, in between my legs. Otherwise you're too crunched up with, mm. you know, cause you don't have a tank bag on that. See, I have to have a tank uh, so I can whip my camera out. So it just makes it a bit crunched up. Mm. Yeah, and along those lines, like getting back to the tyres, the like last quite a few sets I've been running that um, Aussie brand. Was it? I don't know how do you say it there. Mot Moto Z or Motaz? Motoz. Motoz, is that what you, how you say it there? Because some say Moto Z and some. Yeah. So I was running those Rail Zs and yeah. um, for a lot of it through the stands and that, and they, they were good. They were really, really good. Yeah. So I was getting some good life out of those, which which helped. So I extended that on some of the other tyres I used. So I've sort of yeah. stuck with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Solid, solid set. Uh, Aaron, thanks so much for being with us today and, and, and sharing your ideas and your thoughts and your experiences. It's been a real inspiration to, to catch up with you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me, Dave. Hopefully we get to ride it sometime. Come down south when COVID's over. We've got to get this bubble going. Yes, get the bubble break. Yeah, get the bubble going. Get the bubble going. Yeah. <laughs>